Welcome to Gavel to Gavel. I'm your host, Cobb District Attorney Vic Reynolds, and we're very excited to be back in the studio with our partners at TV23 for our eighth installment of this show. Gavel to Gavel is a show about the criminal justice system in Cobb County, and our goal and mission here is to inform and educate our citizens about a system that remains a mystery to most people. In the past, we've taken a look at the different types of court systems in Cobb, the juvenile court, the probate court, We've taken a look at uh, how a clerk's system works and what a clerk's office does. We also have taken a look at what happens to you if you're a victim of a crime in this county. In the future, we'll be taking a look at various other subjects, like what happens if you're called for jury duty or what happens if someone you know or love is placed on probation, something that may affect you or a loved one during the course of their life or uh, time they're in Cobb County. But today we're going to take a look at a very interesting subject, uh, and, and that's a look at a special victims unit that operates through the Cobb DA's office. It's a unit that's particularly designed to prosecute cases where children are victims of the crime. And I'm very honored to have with me today as our guests two of our sp uh, prosecutors in the special victims unit, Ms. Susan Treadaway and Ms. Hannah Palmquist. Thank you ladies so much for joining us and taking time out of your busy, busy schedule to be with us. Hannah, let's start at the beginning. I want you to tell the viewers what is the Special Victims Unit and basically what it consists of. Absolutely. The Special Victims Unit is a specialized unit within the Cobb County District Attorney's Office. It is comprised of four attorneys, two investigators, three victim witness advocates, as well as two administrative assistants. What we do as a team is we work together to prosecute crimes of a specific nature. We handle most cases against a child, for our purposes that's anyone between an infant and the age of 18. We also handle crimes of a sexual nature against adults, man or women. So when those warrants, when those cases come into our office, they're reviewed to see if they fit that criteria. If they are, we're going to handle that as a team and at any given time, our team is handling approximately 300 cases. So it's a busy unit, obviously. Well, Susan, you know, we, we often uh, form our opinion about the system by, based on what we see on TV, and we say, well, you know, what do prosecutors do every day? What, what would s some of the daily responsibilities of a prosecutor in this uh, particular unit consist of? Well, any case, by the time it gets to our office, has actually already had a lot of work done on it. This is the entire police investigation before the warrant has been taken. Our job, once it gets to the prosecutor's office, is to work as a team with our investigators to take a look at the file to see what may still be needed to complete the case file before we can present that case to the grand jury. It is our goal, within our unit especially, to have all cases indicted within 90 days of arrest. Therefore, it's very important from the very beginning that our investigators move quickly to look through the file to make sure that there aren't things such as outstanding medical records, phone records, scientific records, anything that the officers may have already requested but in fact haven't gotten to the case file in time for us to get to our office since things move so quickly. Uh, what we do at that point once we've made that determination and the investigator starts working on their aspect of the case, our job as prosecutors is to review everything in the file and make a determination of what laws apply, what research we need to conduct based upon any specific issues that may arise in that case, and to file any motions that may pertain to those legal issues. One of our first goals as well is to work with our victim witness assistant. We have three in, in the office, or three in the, in the unit as Hannah spoke of. Um, that work closely with us to make first contact with that victim's family. Most of the time our victims are children, so our contact is going to be with the parent or the guardian of that child. It's very important to do that at the outset of the case because you have to remember this is a very scary time in their lives. We want to make sure that they understand the process. Um, in, in most cases, we will in fact meet with them in our office to educate them about how things are going to go from that point forward and to make sure that they are comfortable. Um, of course, it is also our job as the prosecutor in the case to go to court on any matters pertaining to that case and to eventually try that case to a jury if the need arises. And the cases in our unit can, can involve up to 30 or more witnesses and may take more, more than two weeks to, to complete. Hannah, let's, let's touch on something uh, or, or go in depth a little bit on something uh, Susan just touched on. Obviously, a great deal of the victims you all deal with are the most vulnerable in society, their children. And uh, we, we've touched here on Gavel to Gavel previously about victim witness advocates and what they do in the county. Are there any special services available for these type of victims that, that our unit uh, through the office can, can uh, refer them to? 
Absolutely, and in these cases, we're going to provide the same services that we would on any case, but these are also cases that require more contact and require more information along the process. What we're going to do in these cases, just like in any other case, we're going to mail out that victim witness packet at the beginning. The victims are going to be informed of their rights through the vic Crime Victims Bill of Rights. They're going to be contacted every step of the way. They're going to be informed about things that, such as plea negotiations, whether it's a case that's, that's likely to hit trial. We're going to refer out for services, be it therapy or financial services, that sort of arise out of that case occurring. As prosecutors also, we're going to work more with the victims. We're going to work through the juvenile parents juvenile victim's parents, provided that parent is not the offender in the case. We're going to have the child brought in. We're going to sit down and talk with them on that level, make sure they're comfortable with us, teach them in a more child-friendly way a little bit about the system so that they understand what they're going through. And then even through the point of trial, we're going to sit down with that child should they have to do the difficult task of testifying about what has happened to them. We'll even bring them into the courtroom and the victim witness advocate will be there and we'll walk them through it and show them exactly what to expect to make that dreaded day of trial just a little bit easier and a little bit less of an unknown for them. Well, it's certainly a scary process even for adults and you can imagine for a child what, what, what they're going through at their age. Uh, Susan, you know, in looking uh, at, at a case, obviously when the police investigate or when, when the DA's office gets involved, we talk to victims, we interview victims, and we gather information from them. Is, is the process of interviewing a child a completely different process than interviewing an adult victim in a criminal case? It is very, very different. Um, in fact, there are behavioral sciences that have focused on the development of a child's brain and how a child thought process may be different in entering into an interview type scenario versus that of an adult. It's very important from the beginning that the child is treated differently from an adult in, mar in many respects. Um, one of the, um, the key parts of, of our cases involving children is the component called the forensic interview. This interview is actually a scientific based interview um, based on techniques that have been developed over years to show how children respond more accurately and with more detailed responses when those questions are posed to those children in a non-leading and a non-confrontational manner. Um, all of the detectives that we work with in Cobb County in the district attorney's office, um, and, and then when I say detectives, I'm meaning the de detectives from all of the local agencies, from the police departments and, and local jurisdictions, that those officers and detectives are specifically trained in forensic interviewing of children. This is a very comprehensive training. It is at least 40 hours of working directly with that subject matter and, um, and utilizing techniques of mock interviews and watching interviews of other children so they can understand how to better interview children in their cases. Um, when children are interviewed by law enforcement in Cobb County, that technique, that protocol is followed, which includes creating a non-threatening environment for that child and we, we use a facility called Safe Path that provides us with the, um, the physical uh, location where children are brought into that environment where there are colorful walls, there are um, toys to play with, there are children's cartoons, there's even a specially designed bathroom for the children when they go in there so it's not a scary environment to come in they feel comfortable in that, that setting when they walk into the facility itself. But then again, once the child gets into the interview room with the detective or the interviewer, that child needs to be made to feel comfortable with that person who they've never met before or they've met earlier that day um, to talk about something that's very traumatic to them. In fact, one of the, the key aspects of doing a forensic interview on a child would be to only do one interview on that child. Uh, where you may have an investigation involving adults or where adults are witnesses, they may be spoken to on several occasions about that single event. The goal with interviewing children is always to minimize the trauma by only subjecting that child to one interview. And um, those interviews typically don't last any more than 45 minutes. Well, you know, that's interesting. You, you mentioned Safe Path, and, I, and, I, and before we leave today, I want, I want to make sure we re retouch on that because it's a 
that's a center that we're very proud of in Cobb, and, and we're a little bit on the cutting edge of that. But I, but I was curious, and I think the viewers would be curious too. Obviously, when you interview a child, that's frequently at the initial beginning of an investigation. Does every investigation lead to someone being arrested in, in every time there may be some type of outcry or allegation? No, Vic. In fact, it's interesting. Statistics actually show that um, of all the investigations that are done involving disclosures of some type of sexual or physical abuse, um, and, and more so with sexual abuse, there are more investigations that are done that close without an arrest than those that in fact close with an arrest. It is important uh, to, to remember that any time an investigation is done, specifically talking about Cobb County law enforcement, there is not a single detective or a single officer that is working a case from beginning to end who is making that exclusive decision. In fact, um, there are no warrants or charges that are taken without a collaborative effort, not only from other officers or supervisors in that detective's agency, but also upon consultation with our office and speaking with us about any issues that may arise in a specific case. Uh, it's also important to note that in making cases involving some type of physical abuse, whether it be sexual or um, of, of physical abuse being from, um, from anyone, from a caregiver or someone outside the home, if there are injuries or suspected injuries, those cases are worked in conjunction with medical per personnel. And in our cases, typically we're going to work with Children's Healthcare of Atlanta and also through the Stephanie V. Blank Center for Protection of Children. That's interesting. These cases, I know uh, as a prosecutor and having been in law enforcement for a number of years, are very specialized and very unique cases. Uh, Hannah, I've, as a prosecutor in this, in this unit, and particularly as one of the newer prosecutors in the unit, uh, I, I, there has to be certain challenges that you see in these cases that you simply just don't see in a, in, and I don't mean this in a flippant way, but in a burglary or a drug case or something of that nature. And uh, it, it, let's talk a little bit about what some of those special challenges may be that you would face in, in prosecuting such a case. Yes, as a prosecutor, I find that the challenges you run into really come up at the trial stage. You put 12 people in that jury box and the biggest challenge that you have is dealing with not only misinformation that that jurors have had, but also a lack of information regarding certain issues. These aren't going to be cases where they're going to get what they expect, what they see on TV, a bunch of physical evidence. They're going to get eyewitness testimony from usually a child, sometimes an adult victim. It'll be a he said, she said sort of situation. It'll be a study in credibility. Jurors don't understand certain behaviors. They won't know why it is that a child doesn't make an immediate outcry. They won't know why it is that someone endures 10 years of domestic violence with, without making that outcry. So the challenge in these cases is to create, uh, correct the misconception, rather, that there's going to be all sorts of physical evidence and to also educate them on, on the psychology behind these cases. Well, what, what, what I want to do when we return, we're going to take a short break, but when, I, when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about what happens to defendants if they are convicted, sentencing options that the court may have and things that the DA's office may recommend what happened to someone that commits a crime of this nature. So, ladies and gentlemen, stay with us. We're going to take a short break, and when we return, we'll talk about some more subjects with uh, Susan and Hannah of the Special Victims Unit in the Cobb DA's office. Thank you. We'll be right back. Did you know kids who play outdoors have healthier lungs? Totally. I did. Did you know that boys that play with dolls make better husbands? My son has lots of dolls. 
But did you know Terry Cloth diapers breathe better? I did. Mm -hmm. It's totally true. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you know that strollers have the right of way on the sidewalk? Yes. Yep, I did. Did you guys Did know? you know that kids who eat breakfast have higher GPAs? Yeah, I know. Okay. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. actually what I was going to say. Did you know babies should never touch silver? It's really bad for them. I knew that. Did you guys know that statistically friendly kids have more friends? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's obvious. Did you know most people think they're using the right car seat for their kid, but they're not? Parents who really know it all know for sure that their child is in the right seat at the right age and size. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat to make sure your child is protected. I'm putting that on my blog. I just put it in mine. Welcome back to Gavel to Gavel. I'm your host, Cobb DA, Vic Reynolds, and I'm very honored today to have as our guest Susan Treadaway and Hannah Palmquist from the Special Victims Unit of the Cobb DA's office. Now, Hannah, before we took our break, I, I told you we wanted to get into uh, the area of what happens to a defendant if he or she is convicted of a crime of this nature. If you would, explain to the viewers some options that not only we have as DAs in recommending sentences, but options that a judge would have in sentencing such a person. Fortunately for both the judges and us as prosecutors, there are a lot of tools and sort of creative solutions that we have to some of the problems that we see and protections that we can put in place after convictions are obtained. The two most common outcomes are probation or prison or a combination of those. We have the typical probation with general and special conditions. There's things like don't consume alcohol, drugs, um, no contact with particular people. In these cases, when the crimes are of a sexual nature, we also have special sex offender conditions of probation. Those are going to be more stringent and really aimed at keeping those offenders specifically away from children, both physically and on things like social media. They're not going to be allowed to live by parks, schools, places of that nature where children are going to frequent. So we have that option as well. Most of the time in these cases, you're going to have a combination of some prison time followed by probation and sometimes with those sex offender conditions of probation. A lot of times after convictions also, the statute is going to require by the state of Georgia that this person register as a sex offender and that's another protection in the community. Additionally, there are things that a judge can order that are really going to be specific to the facts of the case. No contact with a particular person, perhaps if the judge or the prosecutor feels that drugs or alcohol played a role in, in the case. One can order that the defendant have to complete drug and alcohol evaluation and treatment or also other various treatments such as anger management. Susan, we, you talked about a little earlier before the break uh, uh, the, the, the joint relationship with the DA's office and various law enforcement agencies. And, I would imagine there are a number of other agencies that you, that you work with as well. So let's talk a little bit about that as well as the, these type of cases being so specialized. Is there any form of protocol that's followed uh, countywide between the DA's office and various other agencies? There is, Vic. There is the, the Cobb County Child Abuse Protocol, and that is a protocol that has been adopted by all law enforcement and social services that deal with children in our jurisdiction. And this protocol provides a framework for how investigations are initiated by each of these agencies and departments, what the role and responsibility is for each of these, and how to work together to provide the best possible result for the child. Now, does that lead into, to the, the, it would seem it would lead into the fact then there must be more than the DA's office and law enforcement involved. Or, or, do we have a relationship or does the unit have relationships with other county and state agencies that you work with frequently? We do. There are several. Um, first, there would be the Department of Family and Children's Services that we meet with along with all social services and law enforcement in our county at least twice a year to discuss best practices and talk about things that we can change and improve on to work at it as a more um, team-oriented environment and approach. There's also the Child Fatality Review Board, which some may not have heard of. Um, sadly, there, there are many child deaths within our jurisdiction every year, and there is a state-mandated board and local committee that um, it is our responsibility to review each of those deaths. There are 18 members on that board. All of those board members are um, statutorily defined as to who they 
need to be, one of those members being a Superior Court judge, and on the State Board is our own Superior Court judge, Latane Kell. Um, we meet once a year annually as a state body, but our specific committee in Cobb County meets once a month in the district attorney's office to discuss all child deaths occurring in our county. And that would include um, medical personnel from the hospitals, of course, the Department of Family and Children's Services, any social services outreach agencies, uh, as well as, of course, the, the law enforcement agency that investigated the death. Uh, beyond the Child Fatality Review Board and the um, DFACS is the Sexual Assault Response Team. And this is administered mostly by the YWCA. That is where we have our meetings um, several times a year where we meet with the, um, the specialized nurses called SANE nurses, Sexual Assault Nurse Examiners, to discuss open cases but more so to discuss the practices any changes in the law, any changes in medical procedures and processes so that everyone is on board with how a sexual assault investigation is initiated in our, jurisdic our jurisdiction and what the steps are that are taken after that investigation begins. Um, there's furthermore going to be the commercial sexual um, exploitation um, um, unit that meets and that is on almost a monthly basis at the Children's Health Care of Atlanta campus and that would be in conjunction again with Children's Health Care personnel with law enforcement. This is to focus more so on older children being the, the teenage children which is normally females um, in the sexual human trafficking cases that we deal with to talk about and this would be a joint effort with not only county law enforcement but at those meetings we're talking about state law enforcement which could be the GBI as well as federal law enforcement which is the uh, match task force and their members from the FBI that meet to discuss the open cases and um, the unfortunate victims that, that find themselves in, in those cases. Um, we also do um, seminars at schools where, um, and I know Mr. Boring with our unit has done that as an outreach program through high schools to talk about um, the, the dangers that some of our young people find themselves in with um, social media these days, things that um, are illegal that they may not realize are illegal that they're doing with their phones through social media, as well as um, the multiple disciplinary team meetings. Those happen twice a week, and the district attorney's office has, as we've stated, four prosecutors. We rotate in going out to um, Safe Path to meet with the law enforcement officers, as well as the Department of Family Children's Services and any other agencies um, that need to be present to talk about any open investigations, talk about going back to the beginning, whether um, charges should be taken, some problems that may have come up in the case, whether or not there will even be charges at all, uh, as well as, um, of course, the prosecutors in our office, we utilize our cell phone to be accessible to those detectives 24 hours a day. You know, it's, it's hard to imagine, and, and we're blessed in this county, we have a good county, and. Uh, uh, some of our citizens uh, uh, probably can't fathom the fact that we see human trafficking cases and we see cases where children are victims uh, uh, more often than, than, than we would like to see, obviously. You, you touched a moment ago and before the break also on, uh, on a center here called Safe Path. And, and Susan, let me stay with you just a moment. I think we're uh, ahead of the curve a little bit in this county because of the Safe Path Advocacy Center. T tell the viewers briefly a little bit about that center that you know about and what it does on a day-to-day -day basis. Safe Path is a nonprofit organization. It is essentially it is a children's advocacy center, and it services children from ages zero to 17 years. Um, it was founded in 1998 here in Cobb County, but in 2007 moved into the the new building, which is actually a part of or next to where um, the um, elections office is here in Cobb County on Whitlock Avenue. Safe Path has many services that it provides to the community, and this includes therapy services, this would be um, crisis intervention, forensic interviews, as well as forensic evaluations and case support management. At Safe Path, there is a specific program that is called Darkness to Light. This is an outreach program or a training program that is available to anyone in the community who wishes to learn about how to prevent child abuse. And anyone from the community can get on the Safe Path website and register for the class. I believe they hold those once a month. 
Um, they also are available to larger organizations such as churches, for example, um, that may, may want to have a larger scale training and those folks will actually go to those um, requesting the services and will do a larger scale workshop um, for them. They also, as we touched on earlier, they provide a safe environment, the physical location where these interviews for the children take place, um, akin to the Children's Healthcare of Atlanta campus, where the goal is to create a comforting and welcoming environment, which starts from the very walkway when you walk into the Safe Path Agency. You are greeted with an archway. They typically have um, fresh flowers planted out there, colorful flowers. Um, they may have pinwheels spinning um, outside. Just so children don't feel frightened when they come into the center and when they walk in, they're greeted by bright colors of green and blue and red instead of just flat gray walls um, that, that you may find in another um, environment such as um, an, an adult facility or a, a police hospital. department. A police department, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Um, it is also um, another project that they have that I would like to touch on is Project Linus, which um, is, is a really special program that um, Safe Path has partnered with. And the goal of Project Linus, there's a group that, that makes blankets. And they, um, they donate these blankets to Safe Path so that when children come in under um, scary circumstances and they maybe aren't feeling very safe, they aren't feeling very secure, to wrap them in a nice new blanket to allow the child to pick out a blanket of their choosing, as well as um, the center provides the child with um, a teddy bear and um, a safety poster that talks about body safety, it talks about um, using the buddy system and um, gives the child, and it's on a child's level, it's got pictures and big letters uh, that, that the children are more drawn to. Um, we also have over at um, Safe Path, which is which is very a very good service that is provided, is the Adopt a Family program, and that is a program that is available to the families that are therapy families over at Safe Path, where during Christmas time there are approximately 30 to 40 families that are adopted by Safe Path. Those families fill out a wish list and organizations and individuals from the community come together to fill that wish list for those families. Thank you. That, that's a great center. We work closely with it and we're very honored to be partners with it. Um, we're, we're running out of time. As this is a subject that we, we probably could touch on for another hour or so. I know there are a couple of issues I wanted to get into that uh, time won't permit this time, but we'll have you ladies back and, and, and touch on some things like mandatory reporters and some other areas that I wanted to get into. But, I did want to take a moment on behalf of the DA's office and on behalf of the citizens of this county to thank both these individuals for what they do day in and day out. It, it requires a certain dedication to be a prosecutor, to be a prosecutor in this area, to see what you see day in and day out. It's, it's a tremendous uh, burden on you, I know, emotionally and psychologically, and uh, we appreciate what you do, and I do too. Thank you very much. To our viewers, thank you so much for uh, watching Gavel to Gavel to, uh, with us today. Stay tuned. We'll have some different subjects in the future. Uh, I'm your host, Cop D.A. Vic Reynolds. Take care out there and be safe. Thank you.